Hello, coffee breakers, and welcome to today's coffee talk on the great resignation. I mean, the great self-actualization. The reason I'm here today with this particular talk is I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and um, in a couple of weeks in Ontario, a whole bunch of people are being called back to work full time. And I've heard so many people this week say, I don't want to go back. Uh, and I was like, newsflash, you don't have to go back. <laughs> and, you know, they're looking at me like, what do I mean? Now, of course, uh, people have to go back to work. They, they've got to pay the rent. They've got to pay their bills. But what I mean is there's so many options now. And um, it surprised me to learn that a lot of Canadians haven't heard about what's going on, which is the Great Resignation. Now, it's known as the Great Resignation that's from the employer's point of view. Uh, but there's been a mass exodus uh, to the tune of like 4 million people or more a month in the United States quitting their jobs, just flat out quitting their jobs. Uh, their give a damn's busted. The vast majority of them uh, were in service jobs. So it wasn't like, you know, high collar workers, uh, although some high collar workers are also changing their lives too, but it was regular people just saying enough, enough is enough. Um, and I pulled up some statistics on it so we can talk about the reasons why and the reasons how, how they did it. Um, and uh, I do want to give you four different options of how to, um, if you don't, if you're one of the people who really don't want to go back to your job at a desk full-time uh, come April 1st in Canada or wherever you're tuning in from, um, I do want to give you some options that you can do along with or instead of um, whether you need an exit strategy or not, or, or you just want to augment your life. Um, did everyone bring their coffee? I got um, coffee from Rooster Coffee, which is my favorite uh, coffee uh, shop in my hood, which is in Corktown. Just, I just need to take a sip because I'm just waking up because this daylight savings time, not for me. <laughs> okay, so um, what I want to say to you, if you're one of the people who um, is thinking, I have to go back, I don't have a choice. Uh, for the first time in history, workers actually have the upper hand in North America and in Europe, except for the war. It's such a, it's such a, it's such a huge thing. I'm, um, my nephews, by the way, are are in the, the sort of the sectors that have quit on mass. They're in their um, mid twenties, early twenties, and they both wanted to sign up and go fight in the Ukraine. Fun fact: um, I was like. I was trying to figure out why, because they're Italian, they're Italian Canadian uh, kids, I call them kids, but you know, they're young men. And and I, I, I just think that there's a whole uh, awakening in society of people that are not feeling a sense of purpose in their jobs. Sure, if you know, one of them works in a mall, one of them's a construction worker, if you're not feeling purpose in your, in your job, whether or not uh, it's a well-paid job, um, of course, you're going to want to do something with a lot of purpose, like fighting in a war to protect democracy, democracy right? But I was actually quite, I was actually quite surprised at that um, reaction. First, I was like, you know, it's not like Call of Duty. It's not like playing a game. Like war is like this is real, and and they full, they knew full well. So um, there's a whole. Most of the people that quit, by the way, were in their twenties. Um, it's a it's a generational thing, like. Um, People are really getting woke, but I'm one of the people uh, who left and I'm well over my 20s and I was also a six figure worker and they're saying that they don't really have a lot of statistics on six figure workers leaving their jobs, uh, but we'll talk about that some more. So the great resignation or the great self-actualization, whatever reason people left, it does feel like we're starting to understand our worth as workers for the most part. Um, I came from the film business and we very nearly had our first strike in like 70 years. <laughs> I don't know why we never went through with it. It was like the perfect, it was just perfect timing. Uh, it was the first time in history that that the workers had the, other, the upper hand um, and we voted ourselves out of it, but we came close. And a lot of other industries, the John Deere workers and there's Starbucks workers who are, or, who are unionizing in Arizona, they have unionized um, and that is spreading. So workers are starting to understand their value. Um, now, in one of the taglines of this group is design your life. Uh, because you can, because I want to, part of my mission is spreading the word that you can design your life. Um, I, I often go back to this, but it was a pivotal moment for me. In 2007, I read Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Workweek, 
and it really, really started to change my thinking around, well, I'm, I'm saying capitalism. I'm not saying I'm not a capitalist being a worker, but, you know, uh, around the, the, the worker function within capitalism of how we are paid, you know, exchanging time for money rather than uh, seeking out a life of value where our job complements that lifestyle, all of that. Um, Work-life balance is part of it, but just also being paid adequately for what you do and, and doing a job you love and, and living not, not to it, like having more of the European mentality where um, you work to live and not live to work which is most of us in North America, we live to work. So when I read Tim's book in 2007, it really, really struck me as like an ideal way to live, but I didn't really, I wasn't even able to implement it until the pandemic, which I think happened to a lot of people. I'm not saying all the people who quit their job read Tim's book, doubtful, but, but um, the pandemic itself allowed people to stop and think. Um, I read an article where they said it's it's like we all experienced a near death and some of us actual death like we, we all experienced a collective near death phenomenon and it forced us and it gave us time if we weren't on the front lines uh, as healthcare workers it gave us time to stop and think and uh, you know just think about what matters and uh, that is probably one of the biggest precipitating factors now if you um, can remember two years back before the pandemic, if you rewind, and I know it's hard to remember, it's even hard for me to remember how much time has passed, but um, I distinctly remember a few years there where uh, so many people were getting downsized, so many um, budgets were getting reviewed and jobs were getting downsized. So many of my friends were asked to take on two or three people's roles because they had fired uh, you know, people in the company and they're like, you congratulations, you get to keep your job, but you're going to be doing two or three times the work for little to no extra pay. And uh, if you can remember that, I distinctly remember that. I had a lot of friends in the corporate world, uh, in the workforce, taking all that stuff on and just burning out. And so they do cite that one of the main reasons this happened is burned out. Burned out? <laughs> Burnout. Um, yes, uh, actually, they. Uh, uh, okay. I had some some uh, statistics on what they actually said. So um, surveys from the Bureau of Labor St Statistics in the U.S. tried to interview all these people, as many people as they could who were quitting, um, and they found the reasons they cited were low pay, feeling stuck, and disrespect. And if you think about all the hospita <laughs> the hospitality workers who bailed, disrespect, that's a huge one, right? Um, yeah, I don't blame them. Making a uh, minimum wage and getting disrespected, two things. So we start to value what we're worth. We start to value our own lives and also our, our value as humans, right? Uh, we stop and think we're in this pandemic collectively. We The whole world shuts down. Um, and we're like, well, you know, we've all probably lost someone. I lost my cousin. There's people who lost uh, close family members, um, spouses. Uh, and you start to... Um, it's like the experience I had when I had uh, I had a cancer scare, um, and it really focused my thinking on what matters. That's when I read Tim's book, by the way. <laughs> that was like the same year. Um, it just started to really focus my thinking of like, what if? What if I only had six months to live? What if I only had 10 years to live? What would I do with my time, right? So all these people left en masse, 4 million people a month in the last up until the last time they had a statistic was January of this year, it was still going strong. Um, there were some, uh, uh, Hustle Magazine did interview uh, over a thousand of uh, the people in the situation. 27% of them said they found a job with better pay. Hallelujah, <laughs> right? Because a lot of jobs are grossly underpaid. 17% um, of them said they found a more rewarding job. Hallelujah. That's, uh, sorry, I say hallelujah in some of my, <laughs> some of my groups when someone gets a win. Um, hallelujah. Find a more rewarding job. Uh, that's always good. Uh, if your job doesn't fulfill you, you might as well work in Starbucks where at least you can talk to people and have some dental benefits, right? Um, burnout. 17% reported burnout, which is that phenomenon I was talking about before the pandemic when people were just getting work piled on them and it's like, take it or leave it. <laughs> And people during the pandemic said, I guess I'm going to leave it. 
I don't have to take it anymore. There are actually more job openings uh, than people to fill them. So the worker has the upper hand. Uh, pursuing a new career path was 10% of the people who responded. The lack of a flexible work atmosphere was 8%. Now, if you're an employer watching this, oh my God, I hope you are making the accommodations that you're gonna need to make for this influx of people returning to work who, who will not be satisfied working at a cubicle for five days a week uh, for, you know, my, my, I wasn't at a cubicle, but my work schedule was 70 hours a week. People don't know this, but um, I used to have desk jobs. I used to have cubicle jobs because I've been in the film industry for 30 years. It doesn't mean I haven't also been in the corporate world because I had to uh, supplement. Film is not a full-time job, uh, especially, you know, in your first 10 years. And so I was heavily into in the corporate world in Toronto. And I have to say, I was offered a life. I was offered like a, what some people would call a dream job, a government job with a 90% pension. I said, no, I was like, no, I said no right away. I was like, I cannot picture it's just the physical work environment of being at a cubicle for 40 hours or more. And it was more in many cases in the corporate world too. My film job was 70 hours a week, but more on that later. Okay, so yeah, those, those were uh, the transitions people made and 6% started a business. So I'm a little bit uh, surprised by that. I would think a lot more of them started a business and we'll find out why soon because it's so easy to start a business and it actually is all of the things. It's rewarding. It's probably going to be more pay um, and uh, you'll get respect because you're your own boss. <laughs> So 64% of the people they talked to switched to a new job immediately. So it's not like they said, I quit, and they sat home and played video games. A bunch of them got better high-paying work right away. 83% of them made more money at their new job. Hallelujah. Okay. So I call this the great self-actualization, and it's about realizing what you're worth. And for some reason, um, it hasn't happened in Canada. For some reason, the statisticians say, although it's quite prevalent in the United States, it hasn't happened in Canada yet. So some people say it's because we don't keep statistics on this. Uh, I mean, I know a number of people who pivoted during the pandemic. If you're one of those people who pivoted or got a new job or any, any of the above, put it in the comments. I, I personally know a number of people who pivoted. I'm certainly one of the people who pivoted because um, I felt like we had to. Um, I wasn't going to go back to work on a film set with 200 people with COVID flying around and an 80 year old mom. There was no way I was going to put her through that. I wasn't going to put myself through that either. <laughs> I uh, was, you know, the other thing I, the other thing that I don't know if, if um, other people relate to this, I was burnt out. I was totally burnt out right before the pandemic. Um, in fact, I was on a six month holiday before the pandemic because I was burnt out. And before that I was just, fried. I, I had so much chronic pain. Uh, and that's, and people are like, oh, it's because you're getting older. Well, yeah, sure. Guess what? It stopped. Uh, <laughs> it stopped uh, for the most part during the pandemic. So uh, I guess working 70 hours a week, I guess uh, the human body is not made for that. Anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the pandemic changed a lot of things for a lot of people, whether the statistics are there in Canada or not. Or not I think C Canadian employers do need to take a look uh, and, and make sure that they um, accommodate their workers uh, in ways that will help them stay if they value their workers. I'm assuming you value your work, your workers if you're an employee. And, and the onus, I think, is also on us as workers to ask for what we want. And so let's talk about that. Um, so for those of you who redesigned your life, cause, cause I know there are fears around this. I posted that I was going to do this talk and, uh, Sandy wrote, um, you know, it's really hard. You can't just switch, even though you might want to switch your job. You can't tell that to the unemployment benefits people. They're going to, they make you fill out forms. Yes. Yes. Of course. Some of the things I'm going to talk about are, um, you don't have to jump ship. I'm not telling everybody to jump ship. I'm not like, Hey, <laughs> there's a better life if you jump ship, but, um, since I read Tim Ferriss's book, since I experienced all the things I experienced in my life change in the past couple of years during the pandemic, I realized it's a matter of a shifting your mindset. Once you shift your mindset, everything is possible. And I mean, everything is possible. And I'm not saying um, that that'll pay your rent. Your mindset will pay your rent. Not immediately. So um, you want to uh, just understand that there are other ways and there are ways you can plan to, to uh, leave your job. Look, even if you love your job, 
there are ways you can plan to make the conditions better in your job so that you don't burn out, so that you earn more money and have more time off. Uh, but it's a matter of asking what you need. So the first thing I want to say of my four ways you can uh, design your life, whether you're staying in your job or not, if you are staying in your job, um, negotiate what you need. Maybe it's something you never thought about. Um, in, in for, I'll give you an example. In my own job in the film business, I was going with the flow. I was making good money. I was, but then one day I realized that people were making a lot better money. Um, and it's not because of the money. But um, when you look around and go, oh, the union terms and conditions are minimums. <laughs> I just never asked for what I needed. I just went with the flow. For example, I don't drive a car. I need a ride. Um, so asking for stuff you need might not necessarily be about money. It might be about certain accommodations. Like I don't have kids, but if you have kids, I need a uh, daycare. I need, um, you know, uh, I need a day off every week. I need, um, you know, the four hour work, sorry, the four day work week is a, is a thing in Europe. It's quite, um, and some people even have a three day work week, uh, more and more employers in Europe, um, make that a thing where they give their, uh, employees a fair wage for working four days a week instead of five. It is something you can ask for. It's probably something that's going to hit North America more and more, but, um, certainly you can ask to work remotely, right, for a few days a week. So negotiating for what you need. It might be a shorter work week. It might be being able to work from home a certain number of days a week or always. Or, you know, don't you love that commercial where the guy's like, I'm moving to Paris and I'm going to be the head of your sales team working from wherever you want to be. Uh, a pay raise. Listen, guys, don't be afraid to ask for a pay raise. It took me so long to do that in my life. But once I did, it was it was easy. It was like, this is my rate. <laughs> Take it or leave it. I don't, I didn't say it like that, but you know what I mean? Just uh, ask for what you're worth. Sometimes we don't stop to do that. We don't stop and take stock of what it's costing us not to do that. Um, you know, longer holidays. I, I'm uh, shocked at the number of people who only get two weeks off in a year in uh, this country, in Canada. Um, holidays. Healthcare plans. Some workplaces don't have healthcare plans, and maybe those employers should start considering that, especially if they're in retail or hospitality or those industries where we're losing people like flies. Um, an assistant. Do you need an assistant? Listen, I did go back to work for a few weeks uh, last year, and I asked for an assistant, and guess what? I got it. <laughs> so, um, you know, in a, in an industry where they're like, this is the, I don't know if, if so film is one of those only industries where you'll ask for something and they'll pull out a giant binder. That's the budget. And they'll say, <laughs> they'll open the budget and they'll go, no, 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 it's not in the budget. Don't fall for that. <laughs> it's, it's just a big, it's just a big show. Um, if they want you to come back to work, they will make it work. You can also re renegotiate the scope of your duties, right? No, I'm not going to do two or three people's jobs like I did before the pandemic. I'm going to do one job and that's my job. And that's the job I was, originally hired for, or you can create a position, by the way. Um, these are all things I've seen people do and or that I have done. Um, yeah, if I, if I can make changes like that in something as rigid as the film business, and believe me, the film business is more rigid than you think, then you can do this in the corporate world. Um, so one of the ways you can make your life better in going back to work in April, um, if you like your job, is just negotiate a better deal for yourself and ask for what you need. That's the, the first thing. The second thing is the thing that changed my life, saved my life, um, and that is start a new business. Oh, my God. And you can start a new business while you're at work. It's not that many hours a week, actually. Um, yes, if you're in the film business working 70 hours a week, you probably won't have time to start a new business. But if you're at a corporate job working 40 hours a week, you have time to start a new business. So, uh, and that's assuming you want to. If there's anything you want to um, particularly help people with or, or anything, any skill you have that you can impart, starting a business. And of course, Coffee Break MBA is all about starting online businesses. It's all about solopreneurs starting online businesses. And I'll tell you why. Uh, because uh, especially if you work uh, with digital products, so courses is a big one. So online courses or eBooks or any kind of document, anything that's digital and doesn't, you don't have to physically ship. 
That's an 80 to 90% profit margin. It's a really, really smart business to start um, because at a certain point, you can even make it passive. So if you're doing courses at a certain point, they can be pre-recorded and you don't have to be physically present for every hour that you originally were when you originally taught the program. Um, so think about it. The technology in the world has changed to the point where anyone can start a business because what you need to do is have a laptop, maybe a ring light, <laughs> Um, have a means of collecting payment. Uh, so for me, that's SAM card. And I love SAM card because it's not only the means of collecting payment, it is a means of creating like sales pages, websites for every single product you have. So that's why I'm so uh, on this page in my group, SAM card is everything. I became an affiliate for them for a um, huge reason. It's they saved my life. I find it's the most accessibly priced and, ex and you know, extensively uh, useful software that you can possibly do when you're starting a business you can possibly buy. So um, between Sam cart, a computer, a ring light, an accountant, you need an accountant if you're not good with numbers yourself, which I'm not, uh, and some advertising spend. Those are your costs when you start an online business. Plus your time in, in, you know, creating the concepts, creating the marketing, setting up your, whatever your digital product is going to be. So it's so easy to do that. And if you saw the ad, I, or the ad, the, well, it is an ad. It's a nine minute Apple ad uh, <laughs> called escape from the office. I put it on this page. So hilarious. They had their 14 year old cousin build them a website. I still don't have a website. <laughs> So you don't even need a website uh, as long as you have a way to sell your product. So Sam card is technically a website for every, sing every single product you sell. So I guess theoretically I have a website, but I don't have a website that I had to pour a lot of money into making. So yeah, ask for what you want. And, and so you can go back to work and make life better for yourself for asking what you need and uh, the conditions that would make, that would give you enough time to breathe and live life and be healthy and have friends <laughs> and have a family. Um, and at the same time, you could also be starting a business or you could do what I did and just quit and start a business, <laughs> which is riskier, but um, not as risky as it used to be because there's not... Um, not a lot of upfront investment, right? Um, so that's the second way that I would highly, and of course I can personally speak to that because it, it did everything for me. Um, uh, funny, I don't experience the ageism or sexism <laughs> that I used to experience in the film business in my new job. <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, they're building a building across the street from my house. There, there's construction. And I thought, why are they building another office building? All these offices are sitting empty now, in part because of the Great Resignation. And they said, oh, no, we're building co-working space, seven floors of co-working space. That's for people like me. <laughs> By the way, I've been using the co-working space at Staples in the past few months and it's beautiful they're building they're building an entire building of co-working space for people like me so they say the great resignation has not been happening in canada but clearly there's going to be a whole building full of people like me <laughs> with remote offices which by the way depending on you know if you can start an online business without a remote office i'm growing to the point where i need one because i need to be filming content all the time and i just don't want to be in my house all day filming content it costs anywhere between 200 and 1100 a month that is nothing compared to what it used to cost to have an office and even in co-working space that is, the higher end is like if you have a private office in a co-working space so technology and you know it, just society, <laughs> technology, society, all the advancements that we've made has made it possible for anyone, anyone to be a business owner. Okay, the third thing is something that um, I think has been a constant in all our industries is retrain for something that you love. Um, if you've had all this time to think and you do hate your job or you do not want to return, ask yourself, what is it about your job that you don't want to return to it. So is it, is it um, that it's not fulfilling? So if it is not fulfilling, what would be fulfilling? And is there a way that you can retrain for it? Once again, it might be something that you have to plan for, create an exit strategy for it. There's a lot of things that you can train for online. Listen, I've, I've launched, I don't know, I can't, I've stopped uh, counting over a hundred just in the past few months, over a hundred six figure careers in the past few months, uh, because people have been retraining at home during the pandemic 
to work in the film business and the work is there like the film business almost it, it stopped for the first three months and then it then it went full tilt so um these people are working going oh my god i've made a yes you can retrain at home online or you can actually retrain you can go back to school that is a third option that we all have always had that option and and you know a lot of people have used that option but i think a lot more people uh will be rethinking things and have been rethinking things and that might be an option that they will go for um and you know you don't have to spend eighty thousand dollars on an mba i'm not saying coffee by the way mb coffee break mba stands for maximum bliss accelerator i'm not pretending to be a business school although i am an online business school but um it, it but mb like you don't have to spend that 80 grand on an mba listen i have pr plenty of friends who did and they're quite they're doing quite well so good for good for good for you if, if that's you but but not everybody can afford to take the two years and the $80,000. But sometimes you can take a program that's six months um, that leads you to a job that you know or that you suspect will be much more fulfilling to you. So that's another option. There's many, many more training options in the world right now because of the proliferation of online training. And lastly, um, you can look for a new job on your own terms. So I know two fantastic career coaches. Uh, we have one inside Coffee Break MBA named Gladys Perez. She's incredible and she works out of New York City, but she works with people all over, uh, all over North America. But um, she's an expert on working with creatives who uh, are getting, uh, you know, trying to get better jobs uh, in um, creative spaces and corporate spaces. Uh, because in New York, to survive in that city, Gladys has had a, a performance career. She, she's sustained a performance career in New York City while also working corporate. Um, and she's a career, she's just a fantastic career coach. And, and I just recently met, um, and, and I hope she, um, I, I know she's here. So, uh, Brent, I hope uh, you clar you can clarify with us even more in the discussion um, what how you help people. But Brenda is a lifer career coach, so experienced, uh, based in Vancouver, Canada, but has so many years of experience in helping people find their ideal work. And listen, if you've never worked with a career coach, it's a brilliant way to find it. Don't do it alone because the the amount of, and maybe Brenda or Gladys have statistics on this. I will post their links uh, in the chat after, after the live, uh, or they can post it if they're here. Um, that is a great way to... Uh, to find your bliss. Uh, designing your life means, uh, you know, it doesn't mean not working. I mean, because a lot of us love to work, uh, but do the work that you love, do the work that is meaningful to you and impactful to other people, whether it's starting a business, whether it's retraining for something else, or whether it's just finding a better job where people do appreciate you. It says I have low battery, but I do see some comments. Fun fact, says Brenda. I love Brenda. Fun fact, 98% of businesses in Canada are small business. Woohoo! Yay to the small business. Judy, if you have kids or pets or need to meet with coworkers, a co-working space is ideal. I have been loving it. Um, and, you know, in my case, it was partly like, I need to get out of my house. It's the pandemic. I need to get out of my house. And, you know, we did it all with safety protocols in place, but I was able to actually get out and talk to people um, and just have people around me when I was working. So I love the co-working space idea. Um, and it is going to be a, a regular part of my life. Brenda. I've been developing and facilitating job search and career planning workshops for 25 years, primarily for employment centers, provincial and federal programs. Incredible. Um, and now, Brenda, of course, you're going to uh, work with solopreneurs, I'm sure, right? Because that's who is uh, individual workers and solopreneurs. We're out there now. <laughs> We're so out there now. Um, yeah, and just having uh, the perspective you have uh, is is so great, Brenda. I, like you, yeah. Um, I hope you also get to meet Gladys. She's such a such a lovely person. When I went to New York, uh, I met a whole bunch of the students that I had made online in New York, and. Uh, students I had made and students I had worked with online. I, I got to meet them in person in New York and uh, Gladys was one of them, a lovely human. Um, and after an injury last year, now I'm in private practice. Woohoo! <laughs> yes, yes. 
Yeah, that lifetime of skills. And Brenda, I get the sense that you love what you do because uh, you've never stopped doing it <laughs> and you want to keep doing it, even though uh, you're not working with the feds anymore or the, or the province. Uh, you still want to help the individual, which is great. It's such a needed service. The, the nature of work has completely changed. Brenda, I wonder, do you ever work with employers on how, because I feel like there needs to be a new position on employee retention in uh, a lot of the bigger companies on how to keep people on board during this completely changing time because they have options, because they can just start an online business. So you guys know uh, what happened to me. I, I had a six figure job in film working 70 hours a week. I was able to match it on an online entrepreneurial job for 12 hours a week. Now I work more because I also do, <laughs> I also write screenplays and, uh, yeah, so I end up working more than 12 hours. But if I just did my online business, that would be the case. Um, so, yeah, because we have options, why should we go back and work 70 hours a week for that pay, right? Like co companies and, you know, people might say, oh, desk jobs are 40 hours a week. I remember when I worked on Bay Street in Toronto in, in the financial world, we were pulling 70 hours a week sometimes. So it's, you know, a lot of corporate types, especially in the higher levels, are no stranger to that. Uh, some of my bosses were working overnight <laughs> in that. Um, yes, Brenda says she loves what she does. Yeah, you got to meet. Oh, my God, you guys, uh, just such people, pe such people, people. <laughs> After working in social service sector so long, the pay was so low. I hear that from every single social worker. And what about like people in medicine? And they, they're so underpaid. Brenda, thank you. Thank you for, for that link. I'm also going to post um, the links you and Gladys sent me. Gladys, I don't think I got your links, but I'll, I'll, I'll find you. <laughs> um, so if, if anyone has any questions, uh, let me know. Um, I'll reiterate that Coffee Break MBA is for those people who want to start online businesses and who want to learn different marketing strategies um, and who want ongoing coaching. So I do weekly small group coaching. Um, so whoever shows up to the Zooms every other week and whoever shows up to the Facebook Lives every uh, every alternating week. So we, we change it up. Um, and it's individualized to whoever needs what, whatever help at, in that week. Everyone is doing different things inside Coffee Break. Uh, most of us are doing online courses, but not all of us. Some people are doing eBooks um, and other types of, um, you know, challenges and email. Um, just learning how to how to write better copy um, for our email sequences, creating blogs. There's a whole variety of ways you can make money online. Of course, I happen to be an expert in online courses because. I was a teacher for, I was teaching in the classroom for 25 years before I put my courses online. Um, and I was very, very quickly able to uh, translate what I already knew about teaching to what I then learned about marketing um, and create the online course business. How long have I been talking? 35 minutes. That's not bad. My coffee is actually still warm. <laughs> Are there any questions or anything? Do people vehemently disagree with anything I've said? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, people are like that's great but I'm unemployed and looking for work definitely aim higher aim higher that was a joke I used to, that was a punchline of a joke I used to tell about dating when I did stand up I'm gonna call it out aim higher aim higher in your work life aim higher in all the things all good <laughs> Aim higher, everybody. So hopefully uh, something about what I've said has inspired you. It's like when people look at me like I'm nuts when I say you don't have to go back. You know, you don't have to go back on April 1st. <laughs> I hope I've given you food for thought. I hope uh, I wish you all the best in your business endeavors and with abundance. I'm going to have the rest of my coffee. Have a wonderful day.